This Choircast podcast episode is brought to you by Heretic Happy Hour, whose tagline is burning questions, not people. Join hosts Sean DeJaw, December Rose, Dr. Reverend Katie Valentine, Keith Giles, and myself, Matthew J. DiStefano, for a happy hour filled with quality conversation, fine fellowship, and perhaps even a laugh or two. Unapologetically irreverent and crass, yet sometimes profound, we make sure to pull no punches and leave no stones unturned as we discuss the Christian faith. But listener, beware. There will assuredly be some serious sacred cow tipping. If that sounds like your cup of tea, or bourbon if that's your thing, head on over to heretichappyhour.com to stay up to date with us. And be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcast fix. Western Christianity has spent the last 2,000 years telling everyone they're separated from God. This is Not Church with John and Nat Turney. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. My name is Nat Turney. I'm here with my brother, my co-host, my uh, my bosom buddy, as it were, John Turney. Say, hey, John. Hey, John. Was that, you can't see, see, this is when, when video would be helpful because as soon as I said bosom buddy, you made a face. <laughs> like, like you don't remember the TV well, well, show. No, I, love, I do. I, am I the Tom Hanks character or the, uh, uh, was it Peter, Peter Scalaris? Or which character Peter, am I? Was that his last name? Uh, I don't know. He's the uh, he's the other guy. The other yeah, guy. He, he, he's not worthy of a, of a mention. Oh, by his come name. on. There's, there's Tom Hanks and then there's the guy that was with Tom Hanks. Come on. Um, so you can be, I'll tell you what, you have, I'll defer to your uh, to your superior wisdom and age and call you Tom, and I'll be whatever that other guy's name is. But anyway, I don't know if that was a look of scorn for the mentioning of, buddy, of bosom buddies or just, I think you know, my, just poor, my poor choice of words. No, it's, just, it's another <laughs> one of those things that, you know, depending on who's listening and how old they are, they're going to go, what? Yeah, right. What the hell? What's, what's well, that? Fine. Then we are the, um, now nah, I got nothing else. I'm not going to try, but this is the, <laughs> this is the podcast, y'all. Um, welcome to it. If you stumbled here by accident, um, you still have time to get away. <laughs> you, you, you know, you haven't committed to nothing. We're not, we're not charging you for this. So you still have time to run away, but this is, uh, the podcast we call This Is Not Church, uh, where we still do talk about churchy things, but sometimes in a very unchurchy way. So, and churchy, should be in quotes, right? I mean, the stuff we're going to talk about today with our guest is I wouldn't put it in the churchy realm. This is more in the mystical realm. This is more in the spiritual. I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll let Carl d- describe what 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 we're talking about better than I can. But our guest today is Carl Forehand. He's been with us before, so um, if you uh, if you are so inclined, you should go back and listen to our first interview with him, which is several months back. Carl's a, a, a He's just a good friend. He's a good guy. He's, he's, he's writes some interesting stuff. This new book that he has just put out is called Out into the Desert. And I will let him tell you all about that. Welcome to the podcast, Carl. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going? We're good, man. Good to be here. <laughs> it's good to see you. So how's, uh, how's everything in your world, bud? Yeah. So it's been an interesting year, I guess. In, in January, I got, had a stroke. And so most of my, Time this year has been recovering and trying to, you know, go through all the hassle of not being employed and things like that. But also, I've had two books released this year. The Hotel, my novel, released in March. Well, well, I was still halfway flat out, you know, just (laughs) people teaching me how to get dressed and things like that. And my book was releasing. But uh, then the second one is is something Laura and I, my wife and I, wrote two years ago called Out into the Desert, Thriving Outside of Organized Religion. We wrote it two years ago, gave it away for a long time, and then uh, reread it when we were going back and forth for stroke recovery and decided it's still relevant. And when I did the afterword to include the pandemic and all of that stuff, I realized it's probably even more relevant now than it was when we reread it. So that's what's going on with me. Wow. Well, let's uh, let's dive into the to the book. Then it's interesting. So I can hazard a guess that out into the desert, what what kind of what kind of subject matter deals? With, what what it'd be better coming from you? So what are we talking about? Leaving the the confines, the safeties, I guess, somewhat, and of, of organized religion, and what wandering out into something a little more unknown. You know, our group has always been called the Desert Sanctuary. And the way we describe that is when you start asking questions, when you start questioning your faith, when you start asking questions about your beliefs, and when you start changing, 
sometimes it feels like you're wandering out into the desert. And so that was, that was where we started four or five years ago. And probably three years ago, a lady named Cindy Wong Brandt from Taiwan uh, encouraged us. We were already struggling. When I came out, when I stepped down from the pastorate about four years ago and just said, you know, while I'm struggling, while I'm trying to figure this thing out, I can't be a pastor. I can't do this. this I can't. You know, I would question, like, the issue of uh, should I bake the cake, you know, for a gay person. Uh, so I started doing that on, on stage in the pulpit and, and wrestling with it real time, and, and people about lost their, <laughs> their minds. We, we were never <laughs> right. pushed out of a church or asked to leave or anything like that. But I just got to the point where I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't, you know, make these transitions where my church probably wasn't going to come with me. And um, so I stepped down. And so, but while I was doing that, I attended Brian Zahn's church. Nothing wrong with Brian's church. But um, we went there for two years. I think in my mind, I'm thinking, uh, how do I fit myself back into that? How do I? You know, how do I work myself back into ministry with this new set of beliefs? And it just, Laura and I would get in fights on the way home and <laughs> because we're, we're still struggling with, you know, every time we walked into church, we're triggered. There's still things that weren't working for us. And so about that time, after those two years passed and we decided to kind of step out, Cindy Wong Brand encouraged us to take a full year off. And, it, and evaluate it. And so somewhere around that time is when we started kind of blogging about the issues in this book and trying to take an evaluation of organized religion. How does it work in the 21st century? Is it is it something that's viable? Are we addicted to church? Would Jesus go to church? How'd the church run our sex life and things like that? So those first 10 chapters are that. That over whatever period of time, Laura and I sat down together and evaluated those things, and, and just you know, to be honest, and not to not to bash the church, not but but there's there's things like community, so we're, we're hardwired for connection, but is is the church viable community, or is it folk community? Do we really? You know, we hobble into church with a, an emotional need, and do we really find that healing within the walls of the of organized religion, or does organized religion does the organization always come first? So, anyway, the first step was to evaluate those ten or twelve things, and, and as we were doing that, our stories came out, and so it was a good thing for us. It was healing. But the stories went into the book, and then the last half of the book became, you know, are we faking ourselves out? Are we really thriving out here, or are we not? Is this really working? I used a kind of a fresh look at the Beatitudes to kind of help foster that, because I've always loved the Sermon on the Mount. It's always been dear to me, and those teachings of Jesus that I didn't, I never gave up. I didn't want to give up. But all that kind of came together in this book, and we're really, really proud of it. We held on to it for a while, gave it away, and now uh, decided to release it. it. has a beautiful cover, if nothing else. <laughs> and it's doing yeah. well. Doing well yeah. on the... Yeah, yeah, you are. The book is doing well, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think Nat and I can both relate to um, that journey. Uh, Nat and I took different... I think we took different paths as we both kind of came to the conclusion that organized religion, specifically organized religion that is l large in scale. Uh, you know, I think as you, as you pare down the size of church into something like a house church, right? Uh, where there is, uh, there isn't this huge budget for, you know, your laser light show. Uh, you don't have to have the, the multicolor three full handouts. Uh, you don't have a staff of 25. So what, so Nat, Nat's decision was to step away from this, uh, what would be considered a larger church and do more of like a house church 
it's still in, it's still in a facility, but it's, uh, and I'll let Nat explain, you know, how, how he came to that. But my, my story is more similar to yours, right? I, I was an associate pastor. I wasn't the pastor, but at some point things that I was questioning, right? I wasn't allowed to speak on the, on those, you know, those occasions where I was preaching in front of the congregation. I, I couldn't go that far. I wasn't, it wasn't that it was never like, Overtly said, Hey, you can't speak on these things, right? But you kind of knew inherently that if you did, it was going to cause problems. So yeah, I couldn't talk about my, uh, my disagreement with eternal conscious torment, uh, the penal substitutionary atonement. I couldn't talk about my LGBTQIA plus siblings. I couldn't talk about my, where I stood within the BIPOC community, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter. Any of that would be basically taboo and off, off. Off topic, right? It was like something I wasn't allowed to speak, and so I got to the point where I had to just have that conversation with my pastor and say, "Here's," and I just laid it out for him. Here's what I believe. I always thought, as a pastor, that I had a voice because one of the chapters is is about finding our voice in the desert. And I said, "This would be great for Laura. Laura could tell about how she never had a voice inside the church because she was a woman." But I realized the same thing you did that as a pastor. Um, even though I got to, got to talk all the time, and even though I got to write and publish stuff in the newsletter, there was still a lane that I had to stay in. Because when you become organized, you, you have a creed, you have a belief system, you have, uh, and you also have members that expect certain things, and you can't change those. Not without losing your head, not without having trouble. Yeah, what was interesting was as Nat and I were going through this process and Nat was, Nat was coming to the conclusion that he had to leave this larger church to start his own church. And I was coming to the conclusion I had to just leave church. We would have these comments where we would watch each other preach online. And the comment that I would get from Nat or I'd give to Nat is, I saw where you were going and I saw you go right up to that line. And then you, you step back because. Like myself, Nat and I both knew there was, there was a point where we, if we took that next step, it was going to create a problem. Uh, and it was going to probably be either, you know, a calling into the office to talk about what we can and can't say. And I, I can't, again, I'm not going to speak for Nat, but if I ever, if that ever happened, I think that would, I would have quit that day. That would be the day I quit. And they say, well, you, you went too far. I'm like, okay, well, that, I did, I don't feel like I, I've gone far enough yet. And if you're telling me I, I've gone too far, then I don't know what else I can do here. But I'm speaking for Nat over and over again. I'll let Nat speak for himself. No, that's a, you, you, you're, you're familiar enough with my story that you can. Um, yeah. And to be honest, Carl, I don't know. If, I'm not sure where you are. I'm not anywhere yet. I'm still, I'm still trying to figure out if any of it's worth a shit. To be honest with you. So the something that you something that you said right off the bat really resonated, and it's actually something I'm working on right now. Talking about is this notion of of a counterfeit community that we've created, this semblance of community that really doesn't bear any of the real hallmarks of actual community. So if this has been your experience, it's been mine. I mean, there's, it, it's a, it, there's a lot of dishonesty that goes on in there. You know, there's a lot of... My censorship was self-censorship only in the sense that I knew that if I said certain things, I was going to be called out for it. Now I was never explicitly told, don't say this or this or this. But I knew, you know what I mean? It was, it was communicated in other ways. So I self, I self censored in the, just, just to avoid the problem because who needs it? But there was no, you know, there was no real ability. We, we gave a lot of lip service to being transparent and being, you know, being authentic and being, those were the buzzwords that we all use. But in practice, in reality, there was not very much of that. I, th- I think the performance was, in giving lip service to the fact that you could be transparent here. Oh, you can come here and you can be real and you can be raw. Well, yeah, to a point you could. And so that's my, my, my misgivings with institutional religion is, is all of the institutional stuff that goes along with it. You know, and I don't, you know, you may avoid some of that, I think, in, in a, in a smaller organization like mine, where I, I think it's, so in my case, it's, it's more of, of my inability to uh, to gather a crowd, so I'm fine with that. I have a very small <laughs> church. It speaks more to my failure as as a pastor than anything else. But but I don't have any of the I don't have any of the pressures that come along with you know a large congregation that has expectations. I don't have a staff to pay. I don't have you know massive expenditures for facilities. So 
Um, what I have right now is as close to house church as you can. That's not literally meeting in a home, but it's still that same vibe. I wonder for you, do you feel like that institution of church? Number one is, it, was it ever, do you think it was ever Jesus' design? And even, and if it was, is it redeemable? Is there any way we can get back to whatever, whatever we think that original design should have been? So overall, in general, I would say we don't need to go back to anything. We need to create something for the 21st century. But um, I would say, you know, all evidence says that for the first few hundred years of the church, they they were informal. They didn't have one leader, you know, that was the guy, the main guy. And then uh, Constantine kind of came along and joined us back with the state and with the empire. And then we began to have one person on stage, bigger buildings, more institution, and so on. So I think, I think there's evidence, you know, from the beginning that it was, it was more like a family. It was more like a, a body. And, and that it, it, it acted real organically, but it's almost impossible in the way we've designed it for it to work that way anymore. You know, 70% of the money goes to uh, buildings and, and salaries. Most of the time goes into producing the show on Sunday morning. All of the energy is directed that way. And when people say, wait a minute, what about this? When they, or when they say, this is a deep hurt I have, it makes us uneasy, and we do things like spiritually bypass that. It's, it's, and it's, it's never the intention. It's ne- no, there's hard, I, I don't, I, I, I don't imagine there's ever been a pastor that said, I want to hurt people, that I, I want to ignore people, or I want to ignore their needs. But when it, within that system, it's like systemic racism. You know, you, you can't just say, I don't, I don't want that. I don't want to be racist. I'm not racist. But when the system's broken, <laughs> It doesn't facilitate the right things, then, and it is very, very hard to change from the inside. Yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say that's almost bordering on the impossible to change from the inside, you know, and I think that's a, that's a, for, for many like me, that was my, that was my goal for a long time was, well, I'll just, I'll just push against this from the inside. But the other, the other thing that you said, really right off the bat that struck me was, was when, when we get into organized religion, you know, my, my joke when I was, when I was fully, immersed in organized religion was, well, what do you want? Disorganized religion? And uh, <laughs> part of me is like, yeah, hell yeah, yeah. I kind of do. Yeah. Let's put a little chaos back in the system. But because the, the, the more, it's not even just about size, sometimes it's just about complexity, right? The more complex the organism gets, the more headspace it takes up, right? We end up servicing the organization to the detriment of the people inside of it. And so, yeah, I, I was, as you were talking, I had this, I had this sort of image come into my head of like a, like a, like a really messy family reunion where everyone's just getting together and they're just coming in and there's just chaos and noise and people seeing each other for the first time in a while. And, and there's no, you know, and there's times when that's really stressful and there's times when it's just beautiful to watch, you know, it's like Thanksgiving at mom and dad's house when everybody comes in and there's no agenda necessarily, except we're going to hang out and have a meal. Too many of our conversations when I was on staffs at other big churches were about how do we plan Sunday morning so that there's none of that? How do we, how do we orchestrate this, program it, choreograph it in such a way that there's, you know, there's no awkward moments. There's no, I'm sure you've done this before. You've sat in staff meetings and talked about transitions from one part of service to the other. So we have things that flow and then we would sort of beat ourselves up at the end of service. Okay. How do, how could we do this better? But it was all for the sake of our 100% focus, which was putting on that Sunday morning presentation. And, and again, I'm with you. I don't think anyone ever did that out of any sense of malice. I think there were good intentions there somewhere, even though, I, I don't know, but that, that, that's, that's my thought. On I, I, I welcome some of the disorganization and some of the chaos, you know, because <laughs> that's, that's, that's more real anyway. A lot of people say, you know, a lot of people say, well, I, I like church. I like my church. And sometimes I say to them, of course you like your church. It's, it's designed to make you like it. Uh, yeah. Hillsong's the, the ultimate example of that, you know, where it's almost scientifically crafted to, in anything that alters your mood, 
can become addictive. And you go, and that's why you lose it on Sunday. That's why people say to you after you preach, uh, thanks for the fix. Uh, right, and you, right. And you lose it on Monday morning. You pre-use until you can get, get back to get some more. And, and sometimes people overcompensate by uh, doing more and more and more church work. But then, you know, well, maybe it's not a bad, bad to be addicted to something good like church, right? But mm-hmm. then we're still taking people out of their communities to form a faux community. And my example of that is trunk or treat. I never understood that. <laughs> I never understood trunk or treat. We, trunk or treat. <laughs> we take people out of their community to bring them to the church to have a, a quote, of, you know, maybe it's safer, maybe. But, you know, you still, you're just trying to manufacture things, you know, so that people have, have the right feelings so they come back. And, I've, you know, I just, since we've stepped outside of, of the church, we've found real healing. We, found, we did some shadow work. We've done my, uh, the being book that I did was all about, you know, when all this stuff that I'd stuffed down for 20 years as a pastor came out. And we've now been able to, to address that, that deep wounding, that, that stuff that happened and all the shrapnel that came from when I tried to fight things in the church and wounded my family and things like that. So, Carl, why don't you just quit talking about it? You know, I think <laughs> there, there's some people that might say that, um, but that's the reason we can't. Yeah. Is because um, my old denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, the president at one time, when faced with declining numbers, so we just need to go evangelize. And my thought is, you don't, that's not what you need to do. You need to care for your people that are already there, and you need to help them find healing, um, stop covering up abuse, and things like that, and and he- help heal those people. Uh, I was going to tell you a minute ago, <clears throat> Rob Bell, who I'm not necessarily a disciple, <laughs> you know, but I listen to some of his podcasts and I get things out of it. One of the things he's, he he has a uh, podcast called. Uh, it was called the Robcast, but then there's an episode called uh, "A Fish Standing Next to the Ocean," and it's it's and, you know in his style, it's like an hour long explanation of a ten minute uh, discussion. <laughs> he talks about this fish uh, standing next to the ocean and looking out over the ocean. And last year, I got to see. Florida for the first time and saw the saw the ocean and, and got to recognize all that rhythm and beauty and everything there is to, to appreciate about the ocean and that's kind of what he was talking about but he said you know the fish while he's in the water doesn't see the water because he's too close mm. and he doesn't have he doesn't have the right perspective and just for us it wasn't until we stepped outside you know, and, and got that perspective to where we could see all the things that happened to us and all the things that need to be changed if it's going to be viable in the 21st century. And I, uh, I get emotional when I start talking about this. But the way, you know, after the pandemic and Trump and all that stuff that happened in the last two years, we wrote an afterword, and my, my conclusion at the end was this. You know, I don't even like to say reconstructing because it's none of those analogies are good enough. Um, they just don't work. I like the word evolving. And my conclusion was kind of along these lines. Why don't we just concentrate on evolving? Let's, let's concentrate on going inside. Uh, getting better, uh, evolving. And if our religion survives, then so be it. If it doesn't survive, then maybe we never needed it anyway. Maybe it was a man-made attempt to try to bring things under control and make them where they would turn out like we wanted them to. Um, maybe we don't need it at all. I, you know what? The, the, the further down the rabbit hole I go, the more convinced I am that we don't. 
you know? And that's why as soon as you said, um, I don't even like to talk about reconstruction anymore, I'm with you. John and I talked to uh, Bio Komalafe not too long ago. And I still think about that conversation we had with him. And one of the things that we talked about with him was our propensity to leave something in order to arrive someplace else. And he called that the tyranny of coordinates, um, which I just still think is a just a beautiful phrase. But our obsession with arriving, especially as Westerners, you know, in our Western culture, um, as soon as you leave Egypt and you're in the desert, now our thought process is, okay, we have to arrive at the promised land. Um, or go back. Then, or go back, right, because yeah. the damn desert's just too hard. And so, so I know there's been temptations. I know I've been tempted. I have had opportunities to go back. It's not like those opportunities dried up. And there were times in the middle of this thing where I'm like, you know what? It, I didn't like it there, but I understood it. There, there were temptations to go back. Hell, the, the closest I got to going back, and, I'll, and Brian Zahn doesn't know this, but I almost went and applied for a job because he was looking for a worship leader. And that's my, that's, that's my forte. That's what I do. I'm like, you know what? I know Brian. I bet I could reach out to him. I bet I could, I bet I could get that job and go back to, you know, and I love Brian. I, if I was going to work for anybody, I'd work for Brian. It, it struck me as like, why would I go backwards? Like I, the, the only way, the only way out is through, right? And so, but I'm starting to wonder if the worst thing that ever happened to the Israelites was making it to the promised land. Like maybe they were better off in the desert. You know, there is that sense of, of I don't know, of of of, of still, you know, you can call it wandering if you want to, but I call it discovering. And so I hate to see that end simply because we arrive at this destination we think we're supposed to arrive at. And all of a sudden, now we build structures and now we build all this stuff. And I think you don't have to look too far to see that that's what the early church did, which was, you know, take all the teachings of Jesus and then, you know, very, very quickly codify them, put them inside of structures again. And now we have, you know, things that would rival Second Temple Judaism of Jesus' day as far as the way that, you know, the organization, the structure of it, all the hierarchy and all the other stuff. So I, I don't know, man, maybe we would have been better off as nomadic people just staying in the desert, depending on God for sustenance. <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of talk right now among some people that have deconstructed and become more woke and more affirming and so on, and they kind of dive back in, uh, protect their income and things like that. And they will say, those, those people will say, well, don't deconstruct too far. You're not going to have anything left. I mean, you use words like faith. They say, preserve the faith, and they're really talking about preserving religion. But a lot of us still feel, you know, that if you take the desert fathers and mothers, what was going on there, what was really going on there was not a set location. It was uh, maybe set locations where, where people would travel around and, and those that had insight would share with each other. And it was, it was more of a pass-through, transient kind of thing where, you know, for me, it's, it's kind of the thought process that Keith Giles is going through right now with Solo Mysterium, with the uncertainty of everything, and not being afraid to stay there, not, not being afraid to stay on the journey uh, and keep going. And that and, and some of those critics warn of nihilism, and my understanding of nihilism is like nothingness, you know, no hope for life or whatever. But it's not anywhere close to nihilism. Uh, what it is, is a continual evolving, a continual quest for the truth and, and learning to love, learning to do all those things that Christ taught as we're moving forward. So it's never, I don't think, going to be a destination. The pastors I know that are out here in the desert when you start to talk about when people say, okay, so what do we believe and what do we, we need to organize <laughs> and they'll, they'll just start backing up, you know, and, and uh, head in the other direction because that doesn't sound like the right destination. Oh, well, yeah. sadly, a lot of times because we are so institutionalized, right? We are so, uh, it's so ingrained in our DNA that we need to be in a church um, that has, you know, 
the structure that helps us with our faith, with our religion, with moving forward and becoming better stewards and all this. That So now we're out there wandering the desert and we see this oasis, right? This place that we think, okay, well, I finally found it. I'm here. I'm, and as you, but as you get closer and closer, you realize it's not an oasis. It's just a mirage. It's, it's fake. And so I, I, you know, I consider myself someone who's also wandering in the desert. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't have an anchor when it comes to church or anything like that. But yeah, there are times where the old idea of church kind of starts pulling me towards something. It's like, well, yeah, but I'm, I'm out here, you know, wandering and shouldn't I be with other people figuring this out together? And so, like Nat says, there's this, there's this pull to go back to a church, but I, I, I'm not there. I don't, I, I don't want to do that. Um, I, you know, I recently tried to find an affirming church within our, within our community and there, there are a couple. And so I, I try to talk myself into stepping into a church and I'm just, I'm not prepared. I'm not ready for that. I'm not saying that will never happen. And I think, I think that's where you're at too. It's like, we're not, we're not saying this will never be something we would step back into, but I just, I don't see how that works. I don't, I don't see, I just don't see that happening in any of my, in, in the near future for me because um, I'm finding out, I'm learning so much more out here with people like you who are also, you know, asking hard questions, calling out the church for some of its missteps, right? Uh, things that's tried to hide within the walls of, of the church. And I think, I, like you said, I think that the 21st century just demands something different. We can't keep doing the same old, same old thing, right? So, Kyle, do you guys know Kyle Butler? Yeah, yeah. Kyle is one of our co-hosts on the Desert Sanctuary. And, and Kyle, Kyle has, number one, healed. Kyle has you now found some base philosophies for life that have made him a, a much better person. Um, he lives that out. He influences people. He teaches people. And, and he wouldn't say that he's an atheist, but he is definitely still on the journey and, and still not attached to anything permanent. And, and it, he has a great influence on me. And, and many of my other friends are the same way. And we're, we're still, still on a journey, but we're healing. We're growing. We're learning. We're, uh, becoming more aware, more enlightened, all those things. So, I mean, kind of, kind of the, you know, the the rub with writing my book was, why, you know, what's the big reason for me to go back, and what's the big reason for us to keep wounding people, to keep covering up abuse and all those things, and and then w- even when we're not doing anything overt like that. We're, we're still not accomplishing the basic goals that Jesus or whoever you're going to follow put out before us. You know, the, the basic things like love and compassion and, and, and um, all those things that make us better. So, so, you know, kind of my thing, my, my struggle in the book and writing the book was, why should I? You know, I'm, I'm desperately searching for a reason here why I should, and I can't find it. Yeah, I'm with, I'm with you. Actually, like one of the, so I say this as a guy who just planted a church, you know, two, right. about two years ago, three years ago. And, uh, but literally like this, like the second sermon I ever preached in this church is like, do you really need church? And, mm-hmm. and maybe that's, you know, maybe that's why no one comes, but uh, maybe it was too effective. <laughs> um, but, but my conclusion was you don't, you don't, the church mm-hmm. needs you, you know, mm-hmm. I think, and I think mm-hmm. there is, um, so at least in my, in my still, my still forming brain, you know, I still see, at least, you know, in theory, uh, I still see that there is a role that a church can serve. I think there's a, I think there's places where they, where that kind of community and that kind of connection can be helpful. I just haven't seen it played out very often, you know, because I think the realities are, you know, go back to the, go back to, to your topic of addiction. And the things that we're addicted to end up being where we put most of our resources and efforts. And so, so for a lot of us who were, you know, admittedly, I will admit, 
I, I was addicted to the adulation. You know, I'm addicted to, um, to some, some sense of importance and that, and religion fed that really, really well. Um, and so suddenly, you know, uh, my friend Caleb, who, uh, you know, I, I speak about quite a bit, but he was, you know, he's the first one who told me, he's like, well, the, the stage is intoxicating. So I had to get off of it because, because that platform, no matter how big or how small it is, still, it still feeds that addiction. Um, of notoriety and you still want people, you know, looking to you for certain things. And so, yeah, I just don't know. You know, I, that's why I'm, I'm starting to feel like this, this pull towards more of like a more nomadic kind of faith experience. It says, okay, I was just willing to say stuff like Kyle would say, which I think he would say, uh, at, at his best days, he's agnostic. Yeah. I remember talking to, I think Michelle Collins put it that way. She's like, you know, most, you know, some days I believe in God, some days I don't. And that was, she had friends who were uncomfortable with that level of uncertainty, but she was just being honest. You know, man, there's days when I just don't believe at all. I'm a guy st- who stands in a pulpit, you know, who, who preaches every other Sunday, basically, and says, I think this is how it looks, you know? Um, but I'm willing to admit to you, there are some days I'm not sure I know a damn thing. So I don't know. I, to me, there's a level of honesty there that I think that the kind of religion that John and you and I grew up in does not allow, right? That kind of that kind of transparency that says I'm not even sure I believe any of this stuff, um, but there is something compelling about this person of Jesus. There is still something that pulls me into the story that I, I have not managed to let go of entirely. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And so, right now, Laura and I just last night. You maybe if you could you can see if you could read my whiteboard that's behind me. Yeah, I can see um, it. I can't read it, but I can see it. On the top of it, it says it says Oasis. You know, mentioned in the desert. And underneath it, it says, uh, well, it says the Oasis Network. And in the subtitle is, um, for, for deconstructing ministry workers and spouses, I think is what it says. Not very good at reading backwards. So, so, you know, right now at this very moment, that's something we're considering is there's, there's so many pastors, pastors' wives, pastors' husbands. And so on, that just needed somebody to talk to. Another guy we both know, Jason Elam, he and I did so many yeah. podcasts together over the first couple of years that it, it was just therapeutic to us, even just to do the podcast. And so, but then you go, you say something like a, a network of pastors and ex pastors and, and so on. And well, how do we organize that? It's almost the first question. <laughs> Like, oh no, and here we are. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, there's a certain certain purpose. But I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't have a lot of answers like that about about how do you do it. I just, I just know that that the journey of whatever we've been doing the past few years has done a lot for me, and it did more than all of those twenty years of ministry did. Uh, In fact, it's undone a lot of what those 20 years of ministry did. So I think we did, you know, my my third book was about presence and authenticity. So you just have to stay present and say, you know, it's kind of not where am I going, but what am I doing today? Or what am I doing right now? Where am I and who am I? Uh, And answer those questions, probably be a lot better off then what should I organize? Yeah. Well, it, N- Nat's Nat's really good at you know uh, picking on himself and saying you know maybe maybe he's doing something wrong and that's why his church is so small. I think his church is small because he's doing things right. Um, I think I, I think if you maintain a church that's authentic, transparent, willing to admit that you don't you don't know either, willing to talk to people on a one to one basis, willing to say that. Pastors aren't therapists. That if you need therapy, you need to go see it. You know, you, you need to get a therapist if it's help, and and maybe even facilitate that and help them through that. You're gonna you're gonna attract a smaller group of people who are like minded and are also transparent and authentic. And as soon as a church gets too large, the, the things you lose. That's the things you lose. You lose that transparency. You lose the community. You lose. I mean, how many times have you heard someone come up, you know, in a large church? And I, I'm pretty sure you guys can relate to this. And someone will walk up to you and ask you how you're doing, right? And there's only one answer to that in a large church. And, and anyone who's in a large church 
uh, who wants to disagree with me, I'll disagree with you because there's only one answer to that. When someone says, how are you doing? Your only answer is, I'm fine. Fine. I'm blessed. blessed. I'm fine. Blessed. Yeah. But, <laughs> blessed. Out of favor. but if you yeah. want to see someone's eyes glaze over faster than I, I don't know what, actually start telling them how you are. And their eyes are going to glaze over because they've stopped listening because that's not the answer they wanted. They wanted to hear you say, I'm fine. So they can say, see, I reached out to my fellow congregates. I talked to them. We had community. We, we spoke with each other. I asked how they're doing. They said they're doing fine. And gosh darn it, I'm doing fine too. And then we move on to our fake service, our fake music and our fake light show. And everyone can say, see, we got together and we we're all fine. In a small group like Nats, it's, it's too transparent. It's too much like family. You, you, it's going to be messy. It's going to be loud. It's going to be, it's going to be all of that, which we say is what works good. What, what makes community and what makes like Nat was saying, you know, having that Thanksgiving dinner where the, where the, the household just gets kind of loud and out of control. But at the, at the base of that is an absolute love and joy of being together in this chaos. And you just can't have that when you have a church of a thousand or two thousand or whatever. You just, that is one of the first things that just goes away. So there's, you know, is it better to, to help participate in the healing with, with five, you know, than, than for us to have five thousand and just be destroying each other? I have yet to, to hear any, any proof otherwise. Like, like there are things like, these Benedictine sisters that I talked about in tea shop and so on. I did some spiritual direction training and never finished it. Of course, <laughs> I don't finish a lot of things, but they taught me evocative listening and how, how to do this focusing to help with that shadow work and so on. And they would, they would literally set and they'd, they'd just say, they say, John, how do you feel? And where do you feel it? And to an old Baptist, that sounds like, you know, that sounds stupid. But they, they would, I would say, well, I feel sad. And they'd say, uh, where do you feel it? And I'd say, I feel it right here. And they would say, so you feel sad. And that's all they would say. And then they would listen. And they'd wait for that, that connection with that part of us that my church told us to ignore, you know, don't trust your feelings. You can't trust your feelings. Don't, you know, don't go inside. You're dirty inside. So things like that can go on in smaller groups and smaller uh, venues. But they, they are a part of an organization that's not working. You know, a big organization is not working, but... Somewhere down in that, that small group, that small collection of people, the real stuff is able to happen. And so, you know, I, I know that even in, even in big churches, even in, you know, real institutional type churches, that there's still some good stuff going on. I'm not denying that, but it's, yeah. it's small and it's usually the templative side of it. Yeah, but they're having to compete with all the other stuff, right? Um, exactly. They're having, you know, they're they're have they're being drowned out by the. It, it's really interesting to me that you know this is all anecdotal on my end, so take that for what it's worth. But where you see scandalous behavior, where you hear where you where you hear about abuse, where you hear about things that are you know that that are you know even criminal on some levels you, you never hear that happening in these little tiny churches it's always in, it's like the larger the institution becomes the more easily that stuff can begin to kind of be cultivated in small little dark corners of it i say that today as news is breaking that matt chandler is stepping down from his pulpit after some inappropriate stuff went on between him and and another so i've got you know hill songs about the you know they they've had their massive scandals you've had these these institutions that have set themselves up as sort of paragons of virtue. Meanwhile, there's this stuff smoldering. Now, I'm not saying that stuff doesn't smolder in smaller. Of, of course, it probably does. They're human institutions. They're going to be full of human frailty and stupidity. But it does seem like those kinds of things that, I don't know, it just seems that those, those, those kinds of larger institutions seem to foster that a little bit easier or at least be able to kind of go undetected for longer. And then if you have something as large as the Catholic Church that has the, you know, the wherewithal 
and the means to to really really hide this stuff and you know because of how much they have to lose and how much is at stake they'll go to extraordinary lengths to paper over abuse um well we we've just seen that also with the SBC right SBC is the the next one to and i mean the the what they have hidden from what my understanding is 700 pages of lists of people who have abused someone within their church, right? Sexually or physically or whatever, right? 700 pages, not 700 people, 700 pages of people. That is enormous. That is, that is, that is, a, that's on conspiracy level. I mean, not, not meaning that this is a conspiracy, but they, they had to conspire to hide this. This had to be too many people knew and kept it quiet. And, and, and it's just, it's sickening. And this is, I think we'd all agree, you know, organized religion at this level, and when it becomes this big, it, it, it has to protect itself. It has to maintain its own importance. And it has to hide this kind of stuff or it's going to fail. So if, if Nat has, you know, has 10 people, five to 10 people, I don't know how many, but let's just say you have five to 10 people. Um, you guys are listening to each other. You're, you're making time for your, Sarah Bessie said, the church doesn't have room for my grief. And yeah, if you make, you make room for each other's grief, you make time for each other, you listen to each other, you care for each other, com- have compassion for each other, then, then healing is going to go on there. Growth is going to go on there. And, and that's enough. The, the, we don't need to, to grow bigger to prove something. What we're going to do, I think, out here in the desert is we're going to prove to those institutions that they're unnecessary. And when when they get that news, they're not going to be happy about it at first. <laughs> That's true. But the evangelical church has already declined significantly. And another 6% after the pandemic, it's it's just going down. When I when I look back at all my old churches, the, uh, we were pastor at three churches. No, whatever they never forced us out. They they uh, might have got upset with me a couple of times, <laughs> but we left. Uh, but most of them don't talk to us. But almost all of the the young adult and youth that grew up and and evolved past those churches. Most of them don't go to church anymore, and most of them still are my Facebook friends uh, to this day. You know, most most every single member of every one of those churches never spoke to me again when I left. Right. But all of those all of those kids are still listening, and yeah. they're evolving and they're they're doing fine. Uh, I can't hardly think of any of them that you know had a serious misstep. They're all growing, evolving, becoming better human beings. And and they'll they'll do fine in this transition. But there's there's some middle aged, upper middle aged people that are gonna fight. I say, you know, you gotta they're gonna pull the religion out of their cold dead hand just like the, their handgun. You know, it's it's gonna be a battle. Yeah, but you've seen that already, haven't you? I mean I, I I've seen you know, and and as as we get further down the road with this thing we call deconstruction, and I, I think you know we're probably getting near the end of the usefulness of that term. I get it; that's fine. Uh, we'll come up with the next term at some point that'll mean pretty much the same thing. But I had seen that's how I could that one of the ways I could tell that this was going more mainstream was how more uh, how how much more vocal, how much more vocally against it some people had come out. You know, and all of a sudden you have you have people writing books. Of, you have Alicia Childers, whatever her name was, um, you know, writing articles about it and top 10 ways you can know if you're, you know, your, your pastor's deconstructing or woke. They start to paint these caricatures of people like us from the vantage point of someone who has never once, it seems like seriously questioned their faith. And, and I, and I'm to the point in my life and Carl, you may be in the same place as I am, but I, I don't even trust you unless you've had at least one major crisis of faith. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like if you, if, and if you're 20, you, you probably haven't, but you know, I'm, I'm just getting to the point where I'm, I, you know, the only thing that triggers me anymore is people who are really certain. And then I just know you're full of shit. 
I just know. I just know you're, I, I, at some point, it, it feels like you're, like you're posturing for somebody, you know, because I don't think, I just don't think there's enough certainty in the world for some of these folks, but I'm happy. You know what? To be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy in the desert, you know, and I'm not necessarily looking for, um, the next destination to land. And I'm not looking to rebuild any more of the structures that I've torn down because I don't know if I'll be able to avoid the pitfalls of building them wrong again. And that's the one, the other thing that, that Bio and John and I talked about was like, okay, well, how do we know we're not just building something that will have to be torn down again? Because we don't know, we just don't know any better. You know, if we'll, we'll, we'll default to the things we think we know and, and, and all the while we'll think we're building something new and revolutionary and we'll just be building another version of the thing we tore down. Yeah. So and I've already done that. I mean, I've yeah, already done it. three, my three churches were essentially plants. You know, they were struggling plants or replants or whatever. And we were the same way. We thought, man, this is revolutionary. And then it, it real quickly morphs back into whatever it was before or, you know, something else because people are coming. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that it's avoidable, you know, right. unless you're just like no. literally like, like constantly aware, you know, or on guard against doing it. But I was telling John the story, we, we planted this church and, you know, with every intention of it being radical and new and different. And we looked up, you know, right before the pandemic hit and we're like, we were just, we were literally just having meetings myself and my, my co-pastor and, and one of our board members. I'm like, what are we doing this any different? than all the stuff we left behind. We've literally just built a mirror image of, you know, yeah, we we might be a little bit more radical in the things that we say, um, but as far as the structures we've... So for us, honestly, the pandemic wasn't a bad thing. I mean, obviously it was a bad thing, but um, not from the perspective of, oh my God, we had to completely rethink our church. Um, it turned out to be a very good thing in in that respect. Um, and then we actually had the... Had, we were forced to, to rethink everything and say, okay, well, what are we doing here? I mean, our expectations are still the same as they were before. And so um, we completely restructured around um, a new paradigm. So whether that, whether that's, you know, better or worse, I don't know, but at least it, it does feel different. So I'm down to give that a shot. Cause if this doesn't work, I'm done with church altogether, man. I'm out. I'll just go, <laughs> I'll, just, yeah. I'll, just, yeah. I'll just go write books and, you know, meet people in bars and drink beer together and hang out, which is probably just as close as anything else to, to real community anyway. So <laughs> like I said, you know, I think I'm, I'm struggling with our podcast. Just wanted to get back to interviews because that, that hearing of each other is, you know, it's one of the best things in life for our healing, for our growth, you know, for openness. Um, right. And I want to, so I wanted to get back to doing some more of that. Yeah, that's the, yeah. you know, I, I don't know if I, I can't speak for John or I, I'll try, but if not for the podcast, this last little, what a little over a year, I guess we've been doing it, man, I don't know. I wouldn't have had the, I would not have had the interactions I've had with people who are fascinating. You know what I mean? From, I mean, I'm talking from every part of the spectrum from, you know, the transgender priest to, you know, whose episode we dropped today to the LGBTQIA, you know, uh, advocates and allies and, you know, people who are really, I don't know, even, even the lady that was the, the microbiologist who brought in an element of faith. I mean, there was just all this, gosh, it's just fascinating back and forth and exchange of ideas that, you know, was a hundred times better than any church service I've been in. You know, maybe that's why this is not church, John, because this is better than church. Because um, <laughs> we're, you know, we're not just limiting ourselves to, you know, one particular viewpoint. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Guys, yeah. Guys, like, guys like you come on and, 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 and add, your, add your perspectives in and it's, it's helpful and useful, pushes the conversation forward. Yeah, it makes me want to go, uh, you know, makes me want to keep doing it. But so I, I appreciate it about you and I've, I have always appreciated your work. Uh, really appreciate your heart and all of this because I really feel like I can sense that you just have just just love people and you're you're looking for ways to genuinely connect and so I, I think that's awesome man I, I would I, I'm I'll just mirror what Nat says um, copycat he, 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 he can speak for me because uh, we've, known each, we've known we've known each other for a little while but yeah I mean I agree with what he says I mean I, I don't see myself stepping foot back into a church anytime soon so the closest thing I have to what I guess would be church is this podcast. 
and getting a chance to talk to people like you, Carl, and other, you know, other people who are out in the desert with us that are also uh, pushing the boundaries of what faith means, what religion means, what all of this means or doesn't mean. And so the remarkable part, and I think you could agree with, you know, the people you got to talk on your podcast with is, I mean, it, it causes you to first question wh- where you are because I think you intentionally reach out to people like we do that come from different perspectives, uh, come at this from different points of view. And then they, if you're in- intellectually honest, which is a, wor- a phrase that seems to come up a lot, if you're intellectually honest with yourself, you have to listen to what they're saying and it has to change your paradigm also. And um, so it's uh, it's caused me to read books by authors I would never have even looked for. It's caused me to listen to podcasts with people on there that I would have never listened to. And it's caused my my faith or this journey to blossom into like the cover, you know, these desert flowers, right? Uh, of your book, these, these flowers that bloom in the desert, even though this is a, a, a supposedly a scary, arid, dry place. But then this beauty, you, you walk up onto this beauty in the middle of this desert. And that's what this, I think what this journey is. It, it shows us each step is a step towards beauty, towards love, towards a better understanding of community. And I applaud you for speaking out and writing these books on it. I, I, I really do. Next time we have you on, Carl, we need to have Laura on too, though. I feel like I we're only getting half a story, man. So let's, yeah. let's schedule another podcast with you guys and then have bo- have, have you both on. And yeah. uh, we, we get her perspective as well. Or have her on by herself and let her, because yeah. she, she's got the real story. And Either way, man, we're down. We, uh, as always, man, we love we love talking to you. Uh, you've got more than one book on on out there for sale, but the two most recent ones, Out of the Desert, and the other one was called Seeing. Is that right? No. Um, last year was Being. Oh, Being. Uh, I just made that. Then, I've got your sequel written, Carl. It's called Seeing. <laughs> <laughs> so Being was released last year, but we also released a, a novel in between there, and people can oh, find it when yeah. they get out there and look around, but Gotcha. Um, okay. Yeah, it's um, called the hotel. It's that's I'm, correct. I'm looking back that way because it's right there on my bookcase. Yeah, yeah, it is. That was the funnest thing I've ever done. It's right yeah, now. Well, as always, man, we'll link to all your stuff in the show notes. Make sure and check out Carl and his stuff. Buy his books, man. You may not know this, but but guys like Carl and John and me, we write books, and we're we're not we're right, you know we're not selling millions. So go buy a few and help us out. Push up push us up on the on the on the Amazon <laughs> list and <Yeah. laughs> help a help a help a help a fella out, man. Uh, for sure. But, yeah, uh, yeah, definitely uh, support support the work, man. Uh, I I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much for your time, bud. Yeah, Yeah, no problem. All right. Thank you for listening to This Is Not Church. Be sure to rate and review the podcast on your platform of choice. If you would like to partner with us, visit patreon.com slash thisisnotchurch, where you will receive exclusive content such as early access to episodes, videos of upcoming episodes, and live Q&A sessions. Be sure to check out our Facebook group or follow us on Twitter and Instagram. All the links are in the show notes. We'll be back soon with another episode.